Good afternoon. It is good to be here. There are joys and challenges of going last in this illustrious panel of colleagues. It's been a, a rich learning afternoon for me, so I hope it has been for you as well. I want to start with greetings from Holcomb Spencer Bush Treatment Center, the people who I'm going to be talking about today in terms of their clinical work. I'm going to be their voice piece. They're the ones who are doing the day-to-day -day work with children. And I'll start also by sharing two dilemmas, joys and dilemmas, right? Always working with children. Get ready for this. But one dilemma we have is that we have this impossibly long title to what we do, the Center for Children with Reactive Attachment Disorder. There, let me just clarify, there is no bricks and mortar center. We do not have a separate place where we put all the attachment disorder children. We thought that might be a good idea very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> and we changed that and in fact have this process has been embedding that which we know about attachment research and the little tiny bit of what's out there in terms of attachment treatment efficacy into practice. And we, it, we really created our, this approach throughout our whole milieu. So the center is embedded in, that, let me clarify that, and reactive attachment disorder. Increasingly we have conversations as to, okay, that's the diagnosis, but what does it really tell us? And does it really describe who this child is? So I also want to say to you is that we, we, we point out we have a cluster of children with that diagnosis, but sometimes we're talking about kids who don't have that diagnosis and they almost always have more. We're dealing with kids with a whole mosaic of issues. Increasingly, I think, in residential treatment, we're working with emerging mental illness on top of attachment impairments. So that's why they are with us. Okay, those are our paradoxes. The other is that we're trying to help a child learn how to live in family by removing them from family. What's that? How is it that we are actually audaciously saying we're building family life skills in a residential treatment facility? But though I want to share some illustrations and stories today that say that the point of which parents painfully place children in residential treatment is at the point where they really not just saying I'm going to kill the kid. They can think about it actively and this child perhaps is verbally frequently said I'm going to kill you. So we're talking about a very uh, toxic environment in the home that we think at this point is going to make that fragile attachment come apart. So it's, I was thinking today, maybe it's like a big time out for the whole family. So everybody gets to calm down and then we can come back together again and try to rebuild that sense of family. So that's how we live that paradox. Okay, cases, make it real. I'm gonna try to talk briefly and quickly about two, two young persons journey through our program. One I'll call, and this is a composite of many kids' stories so I can c protect their confidentiality. Kevin, age eight. Um, I often sit at the phone and get the phone call from the parent the first time who's heard about our center. You have a center, can you take my kid? So I hear the frustration in that parent's voice. This child has been aggressive to me, says grandmother. He, he doesn't seem to, he's perfect in school, he can hold it together, but when he comes home, he's baiting me, he's vicious, he's hitting me, and it all seems to be directed at me. My husband, he doesn't get it nearly as much, I get it. He doesn't seem to be able to deal with anything. A kid looks at him funny, cross-eyed, and he loses it and starts to punch out. Very low frustration tolerance. Peer relationships, this boy has no friends. Thank you, Anne, for that comment. Our kids do not have community. They've alienated friends, they boss everybody else around, or they have no clue about how to socially engage, so they're the ones sitting isolated on the playground. Uh, early history of neglect. Uh, Bruce Perry and others work on uh, neurologically what has happened to a child and the ne neglect experience is our reality. We work with so many children who part of their deficits are understood by the neglect experience. And their multiple moves of caregiver to caregiver to caregiver sets that precedent of not having an attachment partner at critical windows of their developmental process that allowed them to do skills of self-regulating everything we've heard today. So we know they have that early history. In addition to that, we have children who have witnessed violence and witnessed violence to their caregiver. Kevin saw his mother beat repeatedly by mother's boyfriend. And what did he do with those experiences? He internalized it inside and now he's becoming a very aggressive young boy himself. Diagnosis again, ADHD, bipolar. This boy had bipolar disorder. You know, when you look at the old charts, 
I remember looking at them, rad, bipolar, ADHD, different, right? In our experience, we're seeing kids with the whole mosaic of things. We have a boy with attachment, significant problems, but he also has um, organic issues that affect his mood, and they coexist. And so our caregiver, exhausted, fearful, this is a bad kid. I don't really want to say that, says Grandma, but I feel it in every bone of my body. We work with young kids age 5 to 18, and an adolescent, just to give you another window, of a young lady I'll call Tasha, who's age 16, adopted from Russia. But we work with a lot of kids from the Eastern European uh, orphanages. This is a girl who witnessed frequent sexual activity. Her mother was a prostitute until her mother's death, where she was placed in orphanage, had to be tough in that orphanage environment to survive. And then we have a good, well-meaning Minnesotan parent who's going to adopt this kid and take him across the world to be the daughter she never had. Oh, this is a very well-meaning mother, but she has got quite a task ahead of her in trying to do a patch repair with a child who has internal working model is of constant fear and fight. And so she's done very well, but in adolescence, we have the body changes of that girl. This is a very attractive young lady, and she is able to whip that charm around with those boys like you know nothing. And she, that power infuses her with that, that reviewed kind of hypersexuality. Maybe she's the bigwig of her um, Warren, if you will. And as uh, that gets going, all the work that mom was doing, building up that trusting relationship, seemed to crash as she hit 14. And 14's hard anyway. So now we're having violence, we're having sassing, we're having running, we're having sexual behavior. Boys coming into the house, mom feels like she's lost total control of the home, and she has. And then the in-home worker, not trained by Dina, sees, comes in and sees this situation and says, we have a, um, a differential here. We have a child who is parenting the parent. They're, you know, they're equal in the hierarchy and is starting to recommend parent training. So um, at that point, we looked at residential treatment for this girl because she was so in crisis that out of, out, out, outpatient therapy was really doing nothing to alleviate that escalation of of becoming unglued. How do we know kids are ready for residential treatment? How will we know removing them from home is going to make a lasting impact on their behavior? How do we make sense of these issues to determine the treatment direction? What would you do with Tasha? What would you do with Kevin? And how does attachment theory and research increase our capacity to stabilize or even understand these youth? Again, I wanted to greet my team. Uh, here we are, 58 youth five to 18 and seven group living environments. 90% of our children have trauma exposure. They're in their fourth out of home placement on average. And yet here's the 76% return to their community or their family at discharged. In our center, which we pull out the kids who have this early life experience, who have the diagnosis, or who have a significant store on the RADQ, and I can talk about that later. Uh, we have about 126 youth we've worked with over the last five years. And then our goal is to track their therapy progress and see what works with kids like this. So what are we trying to do? Oh, I have to throw some pictures in here. Uh, institutions and families, do they mix? Are we that fortress on the hill? Are we that locked facility? You know we're not. Our, uh, someone I was interviewing a student for MSW placement earlier today, and she said, are you guys locked? And uh, the staff person said, well, we're locked on the outside, meaning the community can't just waltz in. We have to make sure this is a safe place for kids. And we're, we're in Owen, Frogtown, and St. Paul. It's not always so safe. But the kids can go. And somewhere quickly in our work with them, they have to buy into our program and begin to in invest themselves. Because if they're running all the time, if, if they are total out of, totally out of control, that's probably our variable that we need to get them to a, a facility that will really contain them. But our level of containment is more extreme in the level of program that we offer. It is a thorough group living experience. Uh, so those are the kids that can best survive with us. Good milieu therapy shares the same qualities, I think, that we've been hearing about all through the series of what is a, t a tuned and proactive care from the caregiver to a child. And our goal for all of our kids, I think, regardless of diagnosis, would be to enhance their ability to be in secure attachment relationships. 
So we wanna craft this environment that surrounds a child, that gives this child the increasing sense of, I can use adults when I need them. I can take them in for comfort, I can accept limits from them when I'm going too far, I can explore, I can, get, I can pull back and melt down. And these people around me are consistently providing me with those functions until I can use them myself. And then get out of our center and go home and practice those things in the environment. Uh, a couple pictures. So here we are in the community. We can't just do that with our four walls. We have to get out and we're hiking, we're camping. We've got a playground, there's all kinds of hide and seek attachment games are going down in that playground structure. We have a group living environment that we change. Uh, those cubicles you see in the picture are different kind of developmental play tasks. We'll have a kitchen, we'll have a truck station, we'll have various things that just kind of replicate family life and let kids really get in there and play. A lot of our work is allowing children to regress. It's developmental catch-up. So we want to invite that little kid part of even that tough 16-year-old Tasha to emerge and start playing with dolls and trucks if she chooses to or, or make up her hair or whatever it might be her medium as an adolescent. This is the Children's Center here. We have the benefit of artists who come in from the community in a free arts program who work with the kids around designing this gorgeous mural or um, do uh, drumming or dancing or anything that allows some creative expression to be able to move their bodies in different ways. And this is a child's bedroom. Transitional objects have been referred to. We think about that all the time, of giving, letting kids, you know, they come in with a garbage bag of stuff, but they, if they have a teddy bear, let's bring it from home. They can, we, can, we put pictures up on the wall that children get to personalize their environments. We work very strongly to not have this place be an institution, but a breathing, living place that says, I'm home to the child. So, RTC re retains, an in it's an intensive intervention. It's not for everyone, but it really we want to pinpoint those kids who cannot progress with their developmental steps unless they have this all-encompassing environment that gives them containment, safety, structure, because they're internally terrorized, like you've heard from all of us today, and who just cannot cope with those developmental de demands outside until they do some developmental repair in our environment. Okay, how am I doing? Two minutes? No! All right. Well, darn it. Uh, okay, they're better. They went home. No. <laughs> oh. Well, okay, our, our treatment model has milieu, it has individual therapy, and it has family therapy. Think of that as a triangle. They work together tightly. Milieu is the heart of residential treatment. It replicates those day-to-day -day life experiences where we're structure, nurture, engaging, challenging kids. And we're using all of, of attachment literature to make that real for kids. And I wish I could tell you more stories about how our staff do that. But uh, we, we offer tours, come see. I mean, just something like the other day, Tasha was nervous about something. So she went up to her direct care staff, and from the staff's position, she laced her hands around her in this really contorted, uncomfortable way. How would you like a kid coming up to you, our little gangster kid, lacing her hands around her like, like, an, like an octopus? And then what she started to do was tap on her like this. And the staff in our staff meeting, this is another critical part of the training, you have to have good staff meetings so staff can talk about, I hate it when she does this. It makes me crazy. But then we could translate her behavior to say she was like that little kid pulling at the coattails saying, I'm scared to death help me. And so that was the signal that, that she had developed with the staff. And then we, we use a lot of what's called parts language for, in our world of talking about her little kid part that's scared to death, and I'm seeing that right now. But do you think, one minute, she could show us in her 16-year-old voice, and now we start to try to developmentally pull that kid from little to big and back and forth again to be able to talk about what's going on so now we have some language because we're working all the time on these processes of mentalization, making it, you know, understanding it, saying out loud for the child, and then putting it into words so that they feel mirrored, reflected that the reality is coming back to them from an adult, and then let's do it, let's go. Lots of us language to get it moving again. Uh, individual therapy, oh, multi-sensory, try to use all the arts. It's being with and feeling with a child in terms of making that change process happen. Uh, again, less talk, all kinds of play, drama, built, felt security. 
and um, it's really dancing lessons. We're talking about engaging a child and shifting the way they dance in the individual therapy that therapist is working hard to be able to use some multi-sensory tools like Play-Doh, like Barbies, like tools, like motor oil, whatever you need to kind of give that child that internal sense of it feels good to be with this person. I'm enjoying myself. These are kids who don't know how to play. Where the darn? They're ordering everybody around. Stop. Don't talk to me. Let's be together. And that's the first steps. And eventually then we're using some other tools like timeline, suffering skin. These are storytelling methods to be able to help a kid begin to do much of what we've heard, tell and understand their story in a different way until they're actually able to do problem solving like an adolescent sitting at the table, figuring out where they're going next. Family therapy, I think we've already heard it from our colleagues, we do it very similarly. And that's our greatest challenge of how do we really join with a parent, sometimes who lives in northern Minnesota or right across town, but has so many survival issues that to get us going on the same page, to get that child back into the community is what we have to start from day one about. We talk about discharge from day one, uh, respectfully with the family. So I only have a minute left. I have to say stop, in fact, okay, well, Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'll stop with Maya, because I love to stop with her. I've learned that people will never forget what you said. They'll never forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So with that, um, we urge you to go forth and be encouraged to try attachment-focused work in the work you do.